So we are going to get rid of a lot of com computations. So that is the idea uh, that you can actually save a lot of computations before your feature map. You could do it with a spatial pyramid pooling, or you can do it with an ROI pooling layer. I'm going to tell you what that is. And there was also another part in our CNN that we didn't like. We had these per class SVMs, and we can actually get rid of that as well. And we can have an end-to-end -to -end system that's going to do softmax classification for us and bounding box regression. So let's see what is ROI pooling. We know that there is some region proposal algorithm that's proposing regions to us. Let's take one of those regions on the original image. And then you can just project, do a projections, and that's going to give you a region on your conv convolutional feature map. And this is very easy to compute. We know what convolution we are using, and uh, we can actually find the coordinates of uh, this box or this region on the feature map. So the coordinates, finding the coordinates is straightforward. It's just simple mathematics. Now you're going to end up with the top right, the coordinates of the top right corner, it's going to be R and C. So we're going to end up, I guess, the top right is here. That's going to give you a top right corner. And then you're going to have a height and a width for your region of interest. So that's going to be called a region of interest. So it's going to have a height. Let's take a look at it. It's going to have a width. This point here is the top left corner. What you're going to do is divide your region of interest into bins. It's the same as before. But you do it only once compared to the previous one that was doing it multiple times. You do it only once. So all you need to specify is this H and W. And then the rest of it is max pooling. You max pull these four pixels into one pixel here. You max pull the other four. You put it here, etc. And that's going to give you the ROI pooling layer. So that's going to give you this feature or these feature maps. And the rest of it is straightforward because this has a fixed dimension. It's always H and W. You can flatten it and push it through your fully connected networks. You're going to end up with a bunch of features that you can push through a fully connected to give you the softmax. And then you can push it through another fully connected to give you the bounding box regressor. So that's just ROI pooling. And that's the pooling layer. It's very similar to a spatial pyramid pooling, but you only have one pyramid. You specify H and W. So this idea we saw it before. And H and W, you're going to specify depending on whatever uh, fully connected dimensions that you have in the rest of your network. Now, how do you fine tune the network? You have multiple heads. How do you train that? How do you train these fully connected network, fully connected networks? And how do you fine tune the features or the weights and biases of your convolutions? To save even more time, you're going to sample two images and then in each of those two images, you can sample 128 divided by two regions, regions of interest. And that's going to give you your mini batch. Yes, you might think that there is a lot of bias coming out of only two images, but it turns out that in practice, it's a much uh, faster algorithm and you are not sacrificing that much in terms of your uh, training accuracy in the end. In terms of your loss, it's going to follow the same pattern. What is the alternative? You can sample 128 images and then have only one region of interest per image. And that could be your mini batch. Yes, there, is, there seems to be a lot of bias, but in practice, the algorithm was working with only two images and uh, 128 divided by two samples per image. What is your loss? You're going to have a multitask loss. One part of your loss is coming from the classification. The other one is going to come from the bounding box regression. If you remember for our CNN, you needed to have per class support vector machines. Now you can have only one multi-class predictor and you're going to have K plus one category, K categories plus the background. Now you're going to have a bounding box regressor and these bounding box regressors are going to give you the X and Y location and the width and height. And this is exactly the same as before. This is exactly what we saw here for our bounding box regressors. So we are going after TX, TY, TW, and TH, which are uh, what we are regressing over. It's a transformation and it's a small modification to the 
boxes that we start with. But then you're gonna have multiple boxes that are being predicted. These are multiple boxes per category. So these are four numbers, one, two, three, four. And then you're gonna have K of them. So it's gonna be four times K bounding boxes that are being predicted. Actually K bounding boxes, but then you're parameterizing each one of them with four variables. So it's gonna give you four times K variables that your fully connected network is predicting. And as I said, these are category specific bounding box. Now, what is, our, what is your data to train this? You need to label each one of those region of interests. And we have 120 of them, 28 of them per our mini batch. How do we label them? We know the ground truth class. We know the coordinates of the ground truth bounding box. These are our targets. And then we are gonna have a loss function giving us classifying, uh, actually it's a classification loss function. So there is nothing special about it. It's after the softmax, it's a cross entropy loss. Then you're gonna have a localization loss because we know our ground truth bounding box regression targets. And then we are only doing, we are only including, including the bounding box regressor for non background objects. So if an object is bound, a background, U is zero, then you don't, you don't include it. And it makes sense because you don't want to identify the millions of boxes that you are not interested in. So whenever U is zero, you just don't include it. And U being zero corresponds to background and P zero corresponds to the background class. And that's our classification loss. For localization loss, you're gonna do a regression. This is smooth L1. Locally is going to be L2, but then it's going to be L1 when you are far from your points. And this is more robust to outliers because you're going to have a lot of outliers when you do your regression. And the reason is that these boxes are not in the correct place. And there is their range is infinity. Practically, it could be as large as uh, it could be very large. And the reason for that is these bounding boxes are usually in the wrong place. And some of them are, I don't know, somewhere here. And then you're trying to push that towards the ground truth. So there is a huge difference between the two. So you don't want uh, to penalize too much those outliers. And that's why you're going to use this loss. Locally, it's just L2. And uh, far from a particular neighborhood, it's going to be L1. And it's just less sensitive to outliers. How do you back propagate? Any questions so far? So... The output is going to be sort of variable length, right? There's going to be like many P's and many T's because there could be a bunch of boxes in the same image, right? No, it's not going to be variable length. So it's always going to have this dimension. The soft max is going to output K plus one values. It's going to output this P. And the bounding box regressor is going to output four times K values. <sighs> And then how does it work if there's like two bounding boxes of the same class? So that one, if you remember in our CNN paper, there is a post-processing step and that's non-maximum separation. So this paper was very influential. It's very important. And uh, you are going to do a greedy non-maximum separation. You're going to look at intersection over union and you're going to look at the score and you're going to keep the highest scores for the ones that have the biggest intersection over you right but this one had a the, the idea is that if two boxes have intersection over union of bigger than a threshold then you're going to keep the one with the highest score and that's how you're going to take care of uh, if your algorithm proposes I don't know, two boxes for one class then it's going to be taken care of as a post-processing step during inference so we don't take care of that during training does that answer your question yeah, I'm still I'm still a little bit confused how I'm looking at like the the output is k by four. So how could it output like two two sets of four for the same class? That's okay. It's gonna output it, but then you're gonna have the corresponding complement. Some of those boxes, if uh, there is no dog in this image, the corresponding confidence for a box that's predicting a dog is gonna be very low. And then the non-maximum operation is going to take care of it. It's going to kill it because it's not that confident about it. And what you're saying is that you're not going to have two bounding boxes for one class. You could have that, but then uh, the non-maximum operation is going to take care of it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's I guess what I mean. But is yeah. that is that before this TK vector? It's after the training is done. When you're doing training, you know your ground truth. So you know that there is a box here that's going to be, you know, its coordinates. And then your algorithm is going to predict many of those boxes. And then some of them you're going to analyze towards the ground truth. And you know the corresponding class. So this is exactly what's going to happen during training. But then once the training is done, some of these P's are going to have a huge value. Some of these P's are going to have a low value, indicating that there is no dog in your image. And then there is going to be a lot of bounding boxes, which we are going to get rid of in the non-maximal operation. Oh, because this is the output for a single suggested ROI? Uh, yes. So per each image, you're going to have, let's say, 2,000 proposals. Uh, I think the confusion is coming from the difference between training and inference. Yeah, sorry. But I think that it, if um, like each ROI gives you a vector of your confidence and a vector of offsets, then that, that sort of answers my question. I think that's what was confusing. Yes, so exactly. Each ROI. Yes, you can pass in two basically suggestions and they'll each have the same class and that's how you take care of it at runtime because you'll have two separate P vectors. Exactly. Okay, cool. So Sorry, thank you. So one region of interest goes in and then out comes K probabilities and four times K boxes. So in the end, if you have 128 proposals, you're going to have 128 times K probabilities, and then you're going to have 128 times 4 times K bounding boxes. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I was imagining this is the output per image, but yeah, okay. That, that makes it really clear. Yeah. This is the output per region of interest. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Now, how do you backpropagate through a region of interest pooling layer? Each xi that I'm denoting here corresponds to one of the pixels here. So that's your xi. Y R J is gonna correspond to your points here after the max pool, after your ROI pooling layer. J is the J output and R is denoting which region you were in. So you're gonna have a sub window R of R and J, and that's gonna correspond to this sub window. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do a max pooling. And that's, a, that's exactly the max pooling formula. You're going to choose the maximum x from your region. And then you're actually choosing the index. Let's say this index is the one that you chose. And then y of r and j, one of these values, is going to be the value of x at the particular location that was giving you the maximum. Now you want to know what is your loss with respect to xi. The problem is that uh, you're going to have, you might have multiple R's and J's where this XI is contributing because there might be overlap. There might be a slight overlap. And that's how you're going to take care of the overlap. If I is, you're going to do a summation, you're going to know what is the optimal index. And if your index is equal to that, this value is going to be a one. Otherwise, it's going to be a zero. It's not contributing. And then you can just backpropagate this way. You know these gradients. Actually, you know these gradients, and then you can backpropagate and compute it. That's how you're going to take care of backpropagation. And the problem was that a single xi might be assigned to several different outputs. So now the training is done. The backpropagation, we covered it. We want to go towards inference, and we want to be as fast as possible. There's a trick that you can do. Whenever you have a matrix, these matrices, you know it, their values. Now they are fixed. The training is done. You can do a singular value decomposition and then keep only the dominant terms, the dominant sing singular values. Then you're going to have less computations, and that's going to help you reduce the cost of your fully connected networks and slightly reduce the convolutional cost because convolutions are already uh, good enough. You're sharing a lot of parameters and you're sharing a lot of computation. So that's for inference to make things faster. And how fast did we actually get? In training, you got 18.3 times faster with SPM and without, with SVD and without SVD, your test speed got 98 times faster and 169 times faster. And why did it get faster? Because you're sharing a lot of computation for your convolution. This part is not shared. This is per each region. But then this part is shared. 
you just do one convolution and then you're done. I think we are finishing right on time. For those of you who have questions, you are more than welcome to stay and ask.